Hello, everybody. My name is Nelson Virgil. I'm the founder of Program for Wellness Restoration. It's a nonprofit I created in the early 90s to educate uh, patients and physicians in the uh, field of HIV about um, reversing and preventing wasting syndrome. Then we started working on educating patients on side effect management for the new drugs that came through in 1996. I've been living with HIV since 83. And um, I'm very happy to have been invited by the GRACE uh, project to speak about uh, mostly wellness and health, but related to uh, body changes and weight gain that some of us experience through basically the treatment of HIV. Um, so I'll be basically reviewing all we know about it and what to do about it. So I hope uh, you enjoy the presentation and um, and um, yeah, and if you have any questions, you can ask uh, at the end of the, of the conference. Just a waiver just to allow everybody to know that this information is for uh, basically educational purposes only and in no way is a substitute for the advice of a qualified healthcare provider. So um, I'm just uh, here reviewing some of the data and also the power, uh, the point of view of a patient living with HIV. So the agenda uh, really quickly, and I have a lot to cover, so I'll try to be brief. I'm so sorry about the, how dense this presentation is, but I usually don't get a chance to speak to um, in conferences anymore. So uh, it's basically an update of what I've learned in the past uh, five years about weight gain in a new era of HIV um, new drugs, you know, the integrase inhibitor era. Uh, how to prevent heart disease, how to uh, deal with the situation of increased visceral fat. I'll be speaking about what that means. Uh, some healthy nutrition tips, some exercise tips, uh, weight loss medication review real fast, um, a little bit on hormones and hormones, hormone balance, and uh, the basics on sleep and why that is so important, not only for our uh, energy levels, but for many, many other reasons, and a few resources at the end. So let's speak first about um, weight gain related to HIV medications and what we know in 2020. For those of you that have been around for a while, like I am as a long-term survivor, we have gone through a few changes in HIV and the way HIV attacks our bodies and uh, how HIV uh, medications affect our bodies. Uh, before 96, as you all remember, and it really was a horrible experience, not only of our friends and family members dying, but also they were wasting away, losing a lot of weight and basically dying in bones. That's how I got motivated to learn more about this topic and to create my nonprofit program for wellness restoration um, to actually reverse and prevent wasting syndrome, which really was a top, one of the top killers of people with HIV before 96. Um, at 96, we started seeing the <clears throat> introduction of integrasing, uh, sorry, protease inhibitors and non-nucleosides that started to change uh, our life expectancy and, um, and which, which was great. It was, um, we got another chance to live, excuse me. <clears throat> However, by 97, 98, we started seeing that there were some side effects that were concerning when it comes to body changes. Um, yeah, before 96, we were dying in bones and having wasting syndrome. But after 96, it was the complete opposite. We were gaining weight and gaining weight in very strange and different areas of our bodies. It was not just a general weight gain, but it was basically the accumulation of uh, fat in the visceral, which is the deep organ cavity and the cervical area, which is behind the neck. We used to call that um, buffalo hump. And those two accumulation of fat uh, areas and the, the phenomenon is called lipohypertrophy or the increase of fat. And that was um, mostly the boosted protease, the protease inhibitors with uh, Norvir and, you know, retinavir and all that. And also we had nucleoside analogs called thiamine analogs like ACT and serrate that we're all taking along with uh, protease inhibitors like Trixivan or Calitra or 
a sequina beer, all of those. We also were looking at a strange syndrome of fat loss at the same time under the skin, uh, especially the face. Uh, we have facial wasting as a main issue and buttock wasting and basically a lot of us men and women with HIV we were getting very vain we would see out of the veins under the skin while we we're getting a belly due to visceral fat and some people would get in that uh, buffalo hump which is the fat um, behind the cervical area so those are really distressing we had good news that we're living longer but our bodies were really changing in a way that we we were kind of um, terrified. <clears throat> Lipoatrophy, the fat loss under the skin actually decreased um, a lot after CERIT and ACT were no longer recommended in the US uh, in 2004 because those two agents were linked to that problem. However, lipohypertrophy, the fat gain, is still with us, not as severe <clears throat> as we used to have it. Uh, we don't hardly see any buffalo humps. The belly gain, weight gain um, is, is a little different. I'll be explaining what, what it, that looks like right now in 2020. Um, antiretroviral uh, related mitochondrial toxicity or toxicity to the little energy uh, factories in our cells um, was a big issue when it came to toxicities for lipoatrophy related toxicities caused by serot and ACT and, and protease inhibitors also caused the increase in insulin resistance or the way our bodies actually uh, metabolize insulin to to uh, burn carbohydrates and blood sugar uh, and store it into energy in, in the muscle. So those are uh, along with inflammation, inflammatory cytokines, proteins that the immune system produces to fight HIV um, were implied or in, in, implicated in this, in this problem with lipohypertrophy and lipoatrophy. There were some genetic factors that were identified, but nobody really looked deeper into that, into that data. <clears throat> Excuse me. The term lipodystrophy, believe it or not, uh, we lived with that word for a long time. There were conferences related to lipodystrophy, uh, papers, all that. But as we, as time went by and nobody really found uh, the solution of lipodystrophy, lipohypertrophy, I should say, this syndrome was later changed to uh, the term return to health which I'll explain whether or not that's an accurate <laughs> way to name uh, something that is a uh, disfiguring of the body due to fat gains. And, uh, and that, that syndrome was associated with strong immune reconstitution. So uh, that's where we are now. The word lipodystrophy is, is not used anymore in the clinical world or the conference world. Only the return to health syndrome, which is basically the same, but in not as severe as, as years past. The only treatment approved to uh, decrease or treat and uh, increase abdominal fat is an injectable called Egrifta uh, SR. I'll be, you know, covering one or two slides on that. We really, back in the days in when integrase inhibitors, um, in 2008, I guess, I forget when the first integrase came in, which was Raltegravir, Icentris, when it was introduced, uh, we were really hoping that they did not cause weight gain because they were not associated with mitochondrial toxicity or even insulin resistance, which were, you know, uh, thought to be the main factors involved in, in lipo, lipodystrophy caused by protease and non-nukes and nukes, mostly nucleosides. There were later, uh, these integrase inhibitors were later found to actually cause greater, greater weight gain than protease inhibitors in patients starting uh, HIV medication and also those that were switching from their old medications to integrase inhibitors. And a lot of us were switched to integrase inhibitors because integrase inhibitors do not, do not increase cholesterol. They do not cause insulin resistance. They're actually more potent when it comes to decreasing viral load and they're more effective and they can be taken once a day. So there are many, many great things about this new um, class called integrase inhibitors that really made a huge difference. However, there was one thing that we were kind of uh, really disappointed and, and shocked to find out um, in the past basically four years or so where the data has come out. The trend of the weight gain is actually uh, more pronounced in women, um, uh, African-Americans and 
people over 60 years of age, which is really a lot of us that are living long with HIV have been positive for 37 years. And I know a bunch of people that have been positive for at least 25. So there, there are a bunch of us in, in the United States in the world that are living with HIV for a long, long time. And we're exposed to a lot of the old drugs and we're still dealing with the lipodystrophy um, situation. We have learned that all basically antiretroviral drugs can cause weight gain and that patient related factors may worsen their effect. Uh, fortunately, and very happily about uh, that we know that this figuring lipodystrophy, the one that um, basically created this huge belly increase in, in Buffalo Hump is, is actually rare now in patients that start integrase, they just gain weight and some of it is obviously in the visceral area, but it's a generalized weight gain. And lipoatrophic, which is a wasting, the facial wasting, buttock wasting caused by ACT and serid, are is, is rare to non-existent now. Although there's some developing countries that are still using ACT, unfortunately, because of cost. Um, many long-term survivors, as I said, um, are still dealing with body changes that were not really reversible like we thought. And the weight gain, uh, this is one of the studies presented um, this year uh, online because we didn't have a face-to-face -face CROI conference, um, actually showed that weight gain after switching um, from either protease inhibitors to integrase inhibitors or to from non-nucleosides like uh, Sustiva or a triplet to integrase. It's a little different <clears throat> among the graded, the graded weight gain was seen from the switch to integrase inhibitors from non-nucleosides versus protease inhibitors. And that's, that's a little um, uh, confusing, but in fact is non-nucleosides uh, like Sustiva, um, Intelens, all those were really not associated with much weight gain. So obviously when we switched on the people got switched to integrase from, from non-nucleosides, which is NNRTIs, their weight gain was more pronounced, but really it's also because NNRTIs don't, don't, didn't really show as huge of a non, as a weight gain as PIs, as protease inhibitors. But among those that switched from um, non-nucleosides, like I said, from a tripla to, let's say, uh, TBK, Dolutogravir, um, the analyzed weight gain was greater for females, non-white, older, people living with HIV, and those switch to um, TBK, DTG, dolotegravir, which is, is an amazingly effective uh, treatment, probably the best protease inhibitor that has come to market. And yet, uh, we were surprised to see that um, switching people from the old drugs to DTG from uh, to dolotegravir um, caused more weight increase than anything else. <coughs> And I just wanted to show this confusing graph. Uh, this is body mass index, um, younger and a little older, but still very young people. Um, body mass index on one side and time uh, since they were switched to integrase. And this is before they were switched. Zero is before and zero after zero is after. And I just wanted to show this very busy uh, graph because you to see that everybody's different. These are every curve is a different patient. And so actually some patients had a decrease in weight. Some of them have an increase. So <clears throat> the generalized term that to a statement to say that everybody gains weight is not really 100% true. This is basically a trend after you average all values, but they are people that don't gain weight or even lose weight on after switching. So I just wanted to make that clear that it's not everybody and it's not, but it, obviously if you averaged every piece of data, there's a little bit of an increase in each case. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and this is the NA Accord study, a huge, huge study that followed, uh, in this case, followed people from 2007 to 16, 2016. Um, um, almost uh, 10 years. And they saw definitely a predicted weight uh, increase on higher on integrase inhibitors than protease inhibitors, than non-nucleosides, okay? And if we compare all the integrase inhibitors, the lutegravir or TBK compared to raltegravir or isentris or ivetegravir um, in, in um, yeah, in um, Bictavi, 
they had different also uh, weight gains. So among integrase inhibitors, there's also a little bit of a difference in this cohort at least. And this line down here is non-nucleosides, which tend to also um, create weight gain, but not as severe as all the other ones. <clears throat> And this is a mean uh, in advance. This is another study presented last year, um, the, the advanced study, which is a mean weight gain by sex and type of um, antiretroviral. Women tend to increase to have more weight, uh, weight gain than men. So that's something you can see right away. And those taking um, the lutegravir and, um, and uh, the new tenofovir, the new uh, viriat, the one that doesn't cause um, as many kidney or issues or uh, bone density issues called alafenamide, which is uh, TAF. Uh, this is, this is um, dolutegravir plus <clears throat> uh, FTC, which is um, Entriva plus TAF compared to Entriva plus tenofovir. So those with, uh, when switched to Truvada or start to the new <clears throat> TAF, gain more weight. So not only uh, protease inhibitors like DTG can increase weight, but also the, the tenofovir, the Viriat replacement drug that is actually um, more friendly to the kidneys and bones, but obviously a little bit more enhancer of weight gain. <clears throat> Excuse me. And drink some water. Uh, sorry, I cannot see you uh, while I'm doing this lecture. It's I'm talking to a screen, so it's a little more not as exciting, but yet I'm very happy to be able to be sharing this data that most patients don't know about. And I understand why we haven't really educated patients on this because it is frightening and fearful, even though um, to, to, to talk about this, because these are great drugs and integrase inhibitors have really been the game changers of the, of the field. So that's why my goal today is to speak about, hey, how, how can we manage this? How can we take our integrase inhibitors, which are really good for viral control, and try to minimize or manage this in the best way we can, even though we have very little data on interventions or weight gain related to integrase or, or other drugs. <clears throat> so this is not only just the weight gain in general, but they, they, they actually did a, um, uh, an analysis of, of body composition. So they could actually tell, and this was a um, um, oral abstract presented this year uh, at Croy in February, and they actually measured body composition with uh, in people that were taking um, the Lutegravir, which is TBK and, um, and, and TAF and uh, FTC um, versus um, those taking the same drug, the Lutegravir with Tenofovir, the uh, Viriar, um, or Truvada, you call it, with Entriva. And those taking, uh, basically, this is a, a tripla. So, and this is visceral fat. I'll, be, I'll speak about what that means. It's fat really deep inside the organ cavity. So not only is the weight gain that we're seeing with the lotography, but there's also a difference here in uh, visceral fat with um, a tripla. And there's also a difference between TAF and viriat or tenofovir. Um, when they're taken with uh, the lutegravir. So it's interesting. It is not the increase of visceral fat that we saw back in the days of lipodystrophy, you have to be clear, but there is, um, you know, there is an increase, although it's not as explosive and as dramatic as what we saw before. Uh, and we'll see, I will talk a little bit why that's the case. <clears throat> And this is the, the million dollar slide because nobody has really pinpointed why this is happening. Uh, a few studies <clears throat> presented last year and this year. And, and I'm, I'm glad to see that researchers are actually really now spending more research uh, time on this question of uh, weight gain. Now that we have done, uh, they have done a great, companies have done a great job at looking for drugs that are effective and not as toxic. Um, now we, you know, we, we have this lingering uh, thing that we have to deal with. 
<clears throat> so uh, I'm, I'm glad to see more and more studies coming through, but they're all small. And uh, in the case of how many regimens containing integrase or TAF cause weight gain, they're proposed, obviously, hypotheses or predictors. They're integrase side, and this is TAF. Integrase may be affecting the uh, genes associated with obesity. They may actually induce the creation of fat cells. Um, there may be a better GI, uh, gut tolerability, so I guess people don't lose as much weight. Um, there's a reduction in inflammatory markers um, that may be catabolic or destroy, destroying of muscle and fat. Don't know. Potential correlation with lower energy expenditure. Maybe our bodies are using energy, uh, using up less energy, and we, re, you know, obviously gain fat when that happens. These are all hypotheses, and there you can see there are a few studies that are presented about that. On the case of the replacement of tenofovir, very uh, um, uh, tenofovir actually uh, makes a mild weight suppressive effect. So they say that maybe uh, tenofovir actually helps not not to make us gain weight, but also TAF tends to increase um, cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, unlike tenofovir, which doesn't. So TAF maybe uh, amplify the weight gain effect of the lutegravir. That doesn't really explain why this is happening, but at least there's some hypotheses that they're looking into. And these are different types, uh, levels of BMI, body mass index. Body, ma body mass index is um, calculated by getting your weight in kilos divided by height square in centimeters. And we can go anywhere BMI of 22 to BMI of 40. BMI of under 25 is supposedly uh, normal body weight. This is a woman that is 5'4 tall, more or less uh, the shape. And overweight is anywhere, uh, anybody with BMI over 25 to 30. Uh, mine is 30, but uh, I work out a lot, so it's muscle. So it's BMI is kind of um, not the best uh, way to measure uh, body, obviously no body composition, because you can have a high body weight, but more muscle than, than anything and still have a high BMI. So it's, it's an easy way to, you know, measure uh, something without having to go through uh, expensive body composition analysis like DEXA. So BMI uh, 25 to almost 30, 30 and so oh, obese, this is overweight, obese class one, obese class two, and morbidly obese. And most Americans are in these three groups, 60% of Americans are in, the, in these three groups, believe it or not. And we'll see why. I mean, in the 60s and 70s, we didn't have that much of a problem as we do now. So uh, there's a few hypotheses, and this is uh, everybody, this is not only HIV, I mean everybody, HIV negative, positive women and men, we're getting fatter. Um, we're also getting more sedentary, and we're eating a lot more processed foods with uh, high content of sugar and salt and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a combination of factors um, that are actually creating this issue for most Americans. And I'll be speaking about the effects of BMI on health in general. So as BMI goes up, and these are more comorbidities like diabetes, asthma, arthritis, high blood pressure, and cancer, and these are the different colors of the different BMIs. As BMI goes up, you can tell obviously that comorbidities, all these problems go up, okay? So, um, you know, it's not only, oh man, I'm overweight, I'm obese, um, but it's also the fact that we do tend to develop more health issues when we are gaining weight uh, over what's considered normal. And on survival and actually longevity, and this is not HIV, by the way, this is a general uh, population data, um, the different colors are years of um, people observing like for somebody 20 years of age and they have um, a BMI, you know, you can see for instance, let's pick a BMI of 39, <clears throat> excuse me, and these are the years of life lost. So obviously the younger you are that you spend being obese, the more years of life you're gonna lose, okay? So that makes sense. So obviously they green because it's the younger people. If you're 20 and you have a high BMI, obviously you're gonna lose a lot more years of your life because of your health issues and so forth. So that's, that's all. Uh, longevity has a lot to do with the BMI <clears throat> and how 
long uh, or how early in your life you started with a high BMI. And obesity in general can increase the incidence of diabetes, heart disease, uh, colon, breast, uh, gastric, pancreatic cancer, uh, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, hypertension, stroke, and this high cholesterol, infertility, and all their issues. And people are sometimes not getting the help they need from their doctors, and um, people are spending a lot of money trying to lose weight, um, buying prepackaged foods, supplements that may actually don't work spending money in weight loss clinics, nutritionists, personal trainers, taking uh, appetite suppressant drugs, uh, surgery, um, liposuction, et cetera. So how do we prevent heart disease, uh, which is connected to body weight, obviously? Um, and there's such a thing called the metabolic syndrome that a lot of us with HIV have, and it's a presence of not only uh, and sometimes not really high body weight, but insulin resistance, meaning insulin is is um, not able to do its work. It is, there's a resistance of cells uh, in allowing insulin to grab uh, glucose and store it in the muscle as glycogen, which is, which is a source of energy, a storage. It's almost like the fridge our cells contain with this glycogen. So insulin bounces back and more glucose stays in the bloodstream, which um, the liver converts to triglycerides, which is really fat, dissolved fat that ends up in not only in the liver as fatty liver, but also feeds uh, fat cells um, everywhere, under the skin, in the visceral area, et cetera. So, and the same insulin resistance causes obviously increased insulin because the body, the pancreas is trying to control the higher glucose blood sugar that can actually be toxic to your brain. Um, so when, when we have high insulin and the liver is actually trying to convert all that extra glucose into triglycerides, our uh, cholesterol goes up. We may actually, because our pancreas gets eventually so fatigued and run down, we may actually stop producing uh, insulin or have so much insulin resistance that our insulin doesn't work anymore. So we, are, we have type 2 diabetes which is very different than type one, which uh, is, is a genetic problem. It's a family uh, history issue where you're born with a certain, with a type one type of diabetes. High blood pressure, all that combined can increase heart disease. And yes, there are some studies that show that we do tend to have a 20 some percent increase in heart disease in HIV because we were, especially the ones like me, uh, the long-term survivors that were exposed to a lot of the drugs that cause um, all this, insulin resistant, high insulin, high cholesterol, et cetera. The interesting thing about ins uh, integrase inhibitors is that they are not known to cause insulin resistance or high insulin or high cholesterol. And, um, and yet we have this fat accumulation issue. So there's a disconnect there on, on some of the old explanations that we used to be hearing in conferences. And the risk, the highest risk to, uh, for anybody to have coronary heart disease um, is uh, high LDL cholesterol. Um, low density lipoprotein over 130 if you smoke cigarettes you have high blood pressure over 140 or 90 um, or even on, on blood pressure meds hdl which is a good cholesterol high density lipoprotein under 40 and a family history of early um, coronary heart disease especially if you had a family member father mother grandparents male under 55 or your female your grandma your mom under 65 had a heart disease, heart attack or issues like that so you have genetic predisposition to heart disease and diabetes is also very well known as a risk factor to um, CHD. So how do we try to minimize uh, this issue that not only affects us in HIV, but also in the general population? First of all, do not smoke. That's the number one and the easiest, not the easiest, it's hard for a lot of people to stop smoking. Um, we do have some drugs that may help uh, on uh, with the cravings, but do not smoke. <clears throat> exercise and avoid a diet rich in sugar and simple carbs. We, I'm gonna speak a little bit about diet. We were focusing on fat in the past 20 years, which really led to where we are now. And we forgot that the, the companies were extracting fat to make low fat or fat free foods. We're replacing that fat with sugar and salt. 
what eventually made us all fatter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Fat is not really as uh, big of an enemy as, as we used to think. And sugar, simple carbs are really are the ones to blame in many ways for high triglycerides and weight gain and insulin uh, resistance. So try to lose weight if you're overweight. Obviously, um, that's easier said than done in some in most cases. We have to manage stress. Um, there is a very strong link between, between high stress and uh, cardiovascular disease. And those also harder done, said than done. Uh, some of us learn how to meditate, how to learn how to um, do breathing exercises. Exercise can be a great way to manage stress, going for walks, um, listening to music, even talking to a good friend, and not watching the news as much as uh, most of us are, because the news are in this country and around the world tend to be negative. Managing blood pressure, <clears throat> so, and many people with HIV are having blood pressure issues. Uh, so there are a lot of medications. Some are friendlier than others when it comes to side effects. Um, the ACE inhibitors, the ARBs tend to be friendlier when it comes to that. So a lot of us are on blood pressure medications. The higher the blood pressure, the higher the risk of heart disease and also higher risk of dementia in later uh, years. Uh, triglycerides are the food source of fat cells. And um, we don't have as big of a problem as we used to. Protease inhibitors, Calitra, uh, Norvir, were really, really bad at increased triglycerides. That's why they're no longer in use. And they were replaced basically by integrase inhibitors by, by non nucleosides, like a triple Sustiva did not cause triglycerides in uh, problems for Calitra, Crixiban, Saquinavir, all of them did. And some people take fish oils, so omega 3 fatty acids, since they tend to. Uh, help decrease that. Some people need extra medications um, beyond that supplement. Improving the good cholesterol is, is really hard to do. Um, in, H in HIV, we had issues with, even before medications um, entered the market, we had low HDL. Nobody really explained deeply why uh, the virus decreases a good cholesterol on its own. It's maybe an inflammatory thing. And there are supplements like niacin that could probably increase HDL, but some people experience high flushing um, and feeling hot and, and their, their, their skin feels like itchy. So they can't tolerate it. Um, and they say taking an aspirin, a baby aspirin before that may minimize these issues. Consuming uh, soluble fiber, oats, anything that has fiber in it, I'll show a little bit on that, has been shown to decrease insulin sensitive insulin resistance. Uh, everything, if everything fails, um, obviously uh, having your doctor prescribe a, a statin or fibrate. So although some of these um, medications may have some, some side effects like um, um, high CPK, which is a muscle destruction related issue in some patients. Um, but doctors are, that's one of the area of medicine that are, doctors are very highly educated on. Baby aspirin, um, 81 milligrams, anything higher than that can cause internal bleeding and, and issues with the stomach. So it's, it's actually a blood thinner. <clears throat> and talk to your doctor about lipid friendly or drugs. And as I said, most all integrase inhibitors, uh, no nukes, um, which are, you know, are, are, are a lot friendlier when it comes to cholesterol than the old drugs, protease inhibitors, which a lot of people have been switched away from. So this thing about visceral fat, what is that? Uh, why is that important? Visceral fat, we have several types of fat. We have the subcutaneous fat or fat under the skin, as you can see here. We have the visceral fat, the fat in the visceral area and where the organs are. You can actually pull um, with liposuction subcutaneous fat, but you can't really penetrate this deep area where there are more risks uh, to puncture things uh, by lipo this, uh, uh, liposuction. And there's, <clears throat> excuse me, a fat basically in the back here, but this, Visceral fat has been linked to all health issues. This is a fat that actively produces uh, proteins that affect blood pressure, affect cardiovascular health, triglycerides, etc. It's almost like another organ that increase that 
grows inside of us. Subcutaneous fat is, is basically a protector, a storage of energy. We don't have the same metabolic related complications um, that visceral fat has. And that really has been the main focus in lipodystrophy since HIV medications tend to um, exclusively, uh, not exclusively, but greatly increase visceral fats compared to subcutaneous in most cases. So how do we actually see or know whether our fat is mostly visceral or under the skin? Well, one way to find out is to pinch your abdominal area and see how much of a pinch that is. Anything you can pinch is uh, subcutaneous fat. Uh, you can see around here, basically what you go here, this is a one slice CT scan on the L4, L5 area, belly button area, where you're basically seeing somebody's in, insides as a one slice, like, and on, I've gotten actually this done myself, it's not covered by insurance, but um, you see this area here, this white is visceral fat, it's a fat basically um, in the visceral area where all the organs are, and this is subcutaneous fat. So a lot of us have very little subcutaneous fat because we lost it through the use of ACT and D4T, which is there, in a lot of visceral fat. I do have visceral fat. Uh, I, I have to work at it. That's why I've read so much about it. I'm doing everything possible so that it just stays or decreases, uh, although it's not very easy to be honest with you, to be completely frank, to decrease visceral fat once you have it. You have to basically lose weight and exercise and go through different diets and still um, um, it's not all completely removed. <clears throat> so this is another um, Comparison basically between a person living with HIV with visceral fat and later subcutaneous fat. Um, this is a lot of us uh, long term survivors, uh, like I said, that were exposed to serid and ACT and protein inhibitors. And this is a, a person living with HIV that just has uh, obesity, basically, probably one of the patients that started treatment after 2006 where we were not exposed to all the other nasty stuff that we're exposed in the past. So you see a lot more uh, subcutaneous fat and you know not as much visceral fat as, as this person here. So I would bet this person is probably more a long-term survivor and this is more of a New, new, newly infected or infected in the past 10 years and treated in the past 10 years. And high visceral fat increases cardiovascular risk. Um, you can see in obese versus non-obese, high triglycerides are higher in people with higher visceral fat and HDL is lower, the good cholesterol is lower. So those two factors may actually be implicated in cardiovascular risk. Potential interventions, what we can do, uh, even though we have, don't have much, I mean, the research, um, by the way, the, uh, visceral fat is not only something that HIV positive people have to deal with, but people with diabetes, people with metabolic issues, any, anybody that you see with a beer belly, uh, alcoholic, alcoholic people have a high degree of uh, consumption of alcohol, people with liver issues, um, um, hepatitis, um, chronic liver disease, tend to have issues with a lot of visceral fat. Um, we have no data on low, low carb diets and HIV, but we're trying to really see anecdotal effects. I'm really a true believer that that's one of the best ways to decrease this, this issue. It may not be, uh, some people may think it's hard to do, but I have to say, once you stick to it, um, you tend to get used to it and actually eat more healthy. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. Exercise, especially cardiovascular, which is, you know, walking, um, treadmill, running if you can jog. I, I'm really not a friend of jogging because of joint issues that I have. But anything that makes you sweat, anything that increases your body temperature, anything that increases your heart rate uh, above uh, what we call a normal rate and, and sustains the heart rate increase for at least an hour um, has been uh, shown to decrease fat gain uh, and visceral fat some pilot data, but as I said, we have no research in this area in HIV. It actually stopped. I think it's not because researchers did not want to research, it's just funding um, was, um, was stopped in the metabolic area. Uh, weight reduction, uh, decreasing weight in general decreases visceral fat uh, that proportionally. 
uh, metformin, which is an anti-diabetic drug, a generic called glucophage. There's some data that's interesting, uh, especially men and women with HIV that have insulin resistance may uh, benefit from taking metformin, and they may actually see some fat reduction. And there's a human growth uh, hormone, releasing hormone, which is a grifta, as I said before, it was the only product approved to decrease fat in the abdominal area. And um, the belly fat, as I said, more heart attacks at a higher risk of uh, heart and arteries, high blood pressure, cholesterol, insulin resistance, diabetes. Uh, <clears throat> but reducing VAT may or may not decrease these risk factors, which I'm not 100% in agreement with these studies uh, presented in 2011. But, um, but uh, because that was back in the days when we still were not exposed completely to, to friendlier HIV drugs. So a grifta is a growth hormone releasing hormone making, it's basically a hormone that makes your pituitary gland produce uh, your own uh, growth hormone. And there's some data that shows that we may have low growth hormone uh, production, amplitude of the, of the production. So a grifta um, growth hormone in general has been shown to increase fat in, in large studies, uh, non-HIV and HIV. And growth hormone and the functions of growth hormone are uh, basically you go growth hormone is produced by the pituitary gland um, is is processed by the liver as IGF one insulin growth factor one, which is implicated in, in stronger bones and uh, fat loss, uh, adipose tissue breakdown, um, and obviously uh, the reduction of VAT and fat. So that there's good data. It is, however. <clears throat> the different disadvantages you have to inject under the skin is a water-based product uh, daily uh, for it to work. Um, so that in itself could be a problem for some people. It's a high cost um, product, but yet um, can be covered by insurance or patient assistance programs for people with no insurance. This is the data that got uh, a GRIFTA approved for VAT. And there are three groups, the people that stayed on the treatment, for 52 weeks, people that were on treatment and they were switched to a placebo, and people that were on placebo that were switched to treatment. So the bluest people who stayed on treatment, they had a decrease in in BAT and, and waist uh, circumference as time went by. And people that were in treatment and when switched to placebo had a weight gain after they were switched. So that shows that the drug actually works. And if you stop using it, may actually things may actually return to where they were. And this is a placebo, which you know people were obviously increasing in weight with time. And then they were given the drug, and obviously their fat decreased. So that's what um, got this. This study got uh, a GRIFTA approved by the FDA years ago. And when it comes to exercise and, and dietary changes, there's a small study, six month study on HIV uh, positive people. And um, they actually found that the combination of exercise and um, cleaner diet, uh, decreased blood pressure, and also the waist circumference, our waist um, size. Metformin, people that with HIV that took metformin, also, and had uh, obviously um, uh, insulin resistance, uh, had also a decreasing weight and waist circumference. So I really think this is a cheap drug, a generic, um, that uh, some people may actually want to consider discussing with their doctors. When metformin was combined with exercise, uh, that combination actually was even more effective in decreasing blood sugar, insulin, and insulin, not blood sugar, blood sugar actually stays the same, you don't become hypoglycemic, but insulin and um, the area under the curve. So it's good to basically combine, you know, the best thing to do is to combine a good nutrition, metformin and exercise. And if your insurance or your patient assistance can access a GRIFTA, that will be a four, a four factor um, great combination program that can really probably work dramatically. I wish somebody actually studied that combination. So let's talk about uh, food really quickly. I'm, I'm obviously covering a lot of ground. And what is pre-diabetes? A lot of uh, us HIV positive and negative from the United States are work, walking around. And I say HIV positive people are really this graph was uh, from the uh, from the Diabetes Center in Minneapolis in 2000 that basically is a general, general graph. And uh, this is fasting blood glucose. Uh, somebody that 
uh, basically is normal, has a normal health uh, glucose. This is actually in pair fasting glucose, uh, 101 to 125. Their uh, insulin resistance, insulin production looks eh, normal, but then obviously glucose keeps looking normal in paper, on paper, and then you start seeing slow increasing in, in glucose, you also start seeing an increase in insulin, in insulin production, insulin resistance. Some people can stay on this ten, uh, in this phase 10 to 30 years, and it's called the in, uh, glucose intolerance. It's actually a test you can take where they give you a sugary drink and they measure your glucose at a baseline and then two hours later just to see what your curve looks like uh, to determine whether or not you have glucose intolerance or you're pre-diabetic because uh, um, measuring blood sugar alone does not really tell uh, tell the doctors anything, and those that have that have glucose intolerance for a while, for a few years, tend to eventually develop um, you know, diabetes more. So, so a lot of people in the United States are walking in this group and may actually end up with diabetes. Um, it, this is going to be a problem. It's already a problem in this country, but it's going to become even more so as, unless we change our uh, dietary habits and the and the food industry it doesn't feed us so much uh, processed stuff that is not good for us. So this is a traditional food pyramid that the uh, government has been pushing for years. Until recently, they actually realized this is this is not right. Where they were telling people to eat a lot more carbohydrates, mostly breads and pastas and refined carbs that have basically hardly any fiber and increase actually glucose and insulin resistance. Fruits and vegetables, obviously, meats um, and, 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 and milk and cheese and, and then sweets at the bottom. So this makes sense, but <clears throat> this actually could be one of the sources of the most um, dramatic increase in weight gain that we've had that and the fact that a lot of um, fat became an enemy. You see fat here. This is a, basically a, a bottle of olive oil. It became an enemy and uh, if the fat-free craze basically made us fatter because they replaced fat with carbs, sugar, and salt that made it more appealing to eat those foods. So uh, there are good carbs and bad carbs. The bad carbs are basically the pancakes and the sugars and even the uh, um, a white potato with uh, you know, sour cream and all that. <clears throat> that tends to increase insulin and blood sugar really dramatically, and it tends it tends it tends to take like a few hours for things to come down. Um, the same the uh, car carbs like fruits and vegetables, oatmeal, bread only really high fiber bread. I really am not a friend of bread. I think bread is one of those things that we we if we avoid. Uh, some of us may actually lose weight, and there's a controversy right now, but. It's worked for me, it's worked for many people I know, and, and I'll be talking about the keto diet. But we have in the good carbs, the high fiber carbs, fruits and vegetables, um, we have a raise in insulin and glucose that is less pronounced, and obviously um, it may actually uh, not increase fat and triglycerides as much. The Mediterranean diet has been popular uh, because um, they have observed that countries around the Mediterranean uh, tend not to have as much obesity, although that's changing as we speak, as they adopt more of that American type of diet in those countries with uh, more fast food co uh, um, companies coming through. But the Mediterranean diet is not really heavy on meats and and the, the, they have more vegetables and even the bread is, is healthier, more vegetables and fruit, mostly fish and shellfish. So obviously they're cheese lovers uh, in the Mediterranean area and uh, chicken and meats and sweets like beef and sweets are, are less pronounced. They drink wine almost every day, at least one glass. So in moderation, obviously, and, and lots of water. And this is more or less what it looks like. And um, the problem with a lot of us in the in the United States is that a lot of these fruit, a lot of these, these products require us to go to the grocery store more frequently because they do go bad faster than processed food. But um, that's something that we have to change as we improve our diets. So the fact that we need more fruits and vegetables, more, more, more seeds, uh, and grains, uh, um, um, couscous, and uh, not even couscous. I'm sorry, um, um, uh, and vegetables and 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 sea seafood. 
the keto diet, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a follower, I'm a biased, I have very strong biases for it because uh, I've used it myself and I've seen dramatic changes in, in my belly and weight and, um, and uh, just bloating in general because you are minimizing. Let me st- let's talk about what to avoid, sugary drinks. I mean, a margarita, for instance, has a lot of sugar. Uh, white potatoes, uh, obviously uh, processed foods um, like burgers and stuff, soda and juice, even soy, even beans. Sugar, obviously, vegetable oils, they want you, um, this diet is mostly into olive oil. Um, um, they, they, even some fruit that may have a lot of sugar in it, low-fat foods, because low-fat foods are usually rich in sugar. Uh, processed treats, obviously, um, factory farm meat and fish, and grains in general, mostly breads. <clears throat> um, this is basically all you have to remember. No sugar and no bread. No pasta, no um, no junk food, okay. And <clears throat> excuse me. So you see mostly uh, olive oil, coconut oil, even butter is okay. Vegetables of all colors, um, meats um, of all kinds. I mean, it really is a higher fat, higher protein, higher vegetable um, contents so of fish here. Uh, it's most of the pyramid you can see is vegetables and the meats are, are a big deal. The fats, mostly in cheese and butter, are also not minimized, and some seeds and fruits and, bear, and berries. <clears throat> um, some people freak out, especially doctors and some nutritionists, about this, especially meats and bacon and high fat foods uh, of this nature. But um, this diet is actually showing very good results in weight loss and even cholesterol and triglycerides. I really hope uh, this is an invitation to any researchers that may be watching this to do a study on keto diet and um, and HIV related weight gain and and visceral fat, uh, because I really think this is where you lose weight faster. Obviously, a lot of the weight that happens in low carb diets um, is water loss in the beginning of the of the diet, so there is a dramatic change in weight in the first two, three weeks that really um, is mostly due to, because you do tend to eat more on this diet and be less hungry, because you're filling yourself up with more of a real food and not what we, most of us are eating out there. This is actually a, a study, a very long, big study published at the New England Journal of Medicine, comparing a low fat Mediterranean versus a low carb diet, and the as you can see, the low fat diet was the one where people gained, they lost weight at the beginning because any diet works um, in the first, and these are months, three to four months of um, once you start watching your calories. But then you have a, an increase in the low fat diet people, which were still on a diet, and they've been being observed, and these are 24 months, two, mo- two years had a bigger increase. These are the Mediterranean diet people. And the bottom one is the low carb diet people, like mostly keto and all that stuff. So, you know, at least in this New England Journal of Medicine large study that was shown to be the case. <clears throat> so just in general, what your plate should look like, mostly veggies, some protein, and the carbs have to be high fiber uh, uh, carbs. I eat a lot of black rice that I buy at the grocery store. Uh, high fiber uh, rice as my main source of carbs. Uh, quinoa. Um, sometimes sweet potatoes, although you have to be careful because that's a little bit of a fallacy there that we think it, they don't, it doesn't have uh, simple carbs, but it, it's got a lot of fiber. And mostly reduce fried foods and hydrogenated oils. Um, eat more fish, oils, fish rich foods even tuna, sardines, flaxseed oil. <clears throat> you use more olive oil, which has been shown to decrease inflammation. Minimize sugar and fructose, uh, fruit juices, sweets, um, uh, corn syrup, uh, high fructose corn syrup. And eat enough protein. We need protein to keep lean body mass and, and stay healthy too. Do not skip breakfast. Keep an eye on your sugar and refined flour products. So, because breakfast that most people have in cereals and all that is really rich in sugar. So, mostly don't be afraid of eggs. Don't free. I eat eggs and black rice for breakfast. Sometimes I don't have any carbs, just eggs. 
and um, and coffee, obviously, um, but don't skip it because you've been basically fasting for more than eight hours and your body really needs some nutrients. And something we've seen is people that skip breakfast tend to overcompensate at dinner time, which has been shown to be um, more of a contributor to weight gain and also sleep disorders once you fill your stomach up so much before going to bed. Trying to eat uh, smaller meals and instead of a uh, huge meal, especially large, try to avoid large, large dinner. Eat more almonds, walnuts, pecans, pistachios. They're good for your cholesterol, good for fiber. Eat fruits and vegetables of all colors. Try to avoid the real sweet, sweet ones. Minimize caffeine after 2 p.m. just because your sleep will be more <clears throat> impaired. And mostly spend all your money, most of your money in the perimeter of the grocery store instead of the middle aisles where all the processed and boxed and, and canned foods are. I put here just a, a list of groceries. Um, I think you're all gonna get a copy of my slides. Exercise, basically exercise is the only thing. There's not a pill or medication that can do all this, like decrease total abdominal fat, improve the way insulin works improve uh, glucose tolerance, and decrease, increase the good cholesterol, decrease triglycerides and LDL, uh, increase muscle mass, especially resistance training, uh, improve uh, endurance, strength, bone density, and mood. Um, and when they invent a pill, that does, that, that's all this. Um, somebody will be rich, but I have a feeling this is something we cannot outsource to somebody else. It's something we have to do ourselves, unfortunately. And this is something I've been really um, enjoying lately in the past, two, well, during the COVID uh, time, where I was sitting more in front of a computer and not obviously leaving the house and exercising. The gyms were closed for a while, so I decided to start walking. And in Houston, it's so hot that most of us don't walk, but hey, we had to get over it somehow due to this isolation. Got myself um, um, a, a step counter, which is free, a step counter app on my iPhone, it's called Pacer. And basically I track how many steps I take during, uh, every day and Pacer sends me an alert every night. Hey, you took this many steps. So really we should be aiming from uh, at five to 10,000 steps per day. The 10,000 steps per day have been shown in some data, some, some articles that it may actually be the, the amount of steps we need to do so that we don't gain weight. And, and rightly so. I, 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 Ever since I've been tracking my steps, I, I definitely have not gained any weight, even when I cheat on my keto diet, which is every weekend. Um, and it also asks you a few questions. The apps actually can start um, giving you advice on if you want to decrease weight. You can tell here all the goals here. So it's a very interesting. It's free. They they do not sell anything, which is kind of surprising. And um, I like it, I love it. I, it sends you, you can say seven days, 30 days, six months or a year steps and your history and all that. There are some days where I really walked a lot, like 17, 18,000 steps. <clears throat> Cardiovascular exercise, anything that makes you sweat, anything that makes your heart rate go up. Uh, as I said, 10,000 steps. Take, take a walk every day. It's not only good during COVID, but for your mood and your mind, listen to your music. That's what um, I definitely have. That's the only one of the few good things that have come out, out of this COVID era for me is now finally uh, walking every day and not having excuses about it um, instead of sitting in front of the computer all day. Um, do what you enjoy, bicycling, or skating, whatever it is. Dancing is, is aerobic, it's cardiovascular. Uh, it burns fat, it triglycerides, blood sugar, improves blood pressure. 20 to 30 minutes, uh, three to four times a week is enough for many people. Um, I work, you know, walking for an hour every day, every morning, especially if you get up early, it's actually pretty refreshing. Um, it decreases, like uh, I mentioned before, blood pressure, LDL cholesterol and weight. It can also help increase a good cholesterol mood, bone density, and even improves the chances to not have dementia in, in, in older age. Uh, weight training or progressive resistance exercise is, um, is good for increasing strength, bone density, and firmness in the, in the body. As we get older, we start getting softer because our lean body mass decreases as our fat mass increases. Um, just uh, use machines. I tend to not do free weights because of 
some issues that are with my back. Uh, I have nothing to do with the gym, but um, some congenital issues. Uh, eight to 12 reps um, to maximum failure, meaning the weight that you can handle. And that means different things to different people. One hour sessions, three times a week, no more than that. Uh, three sets per body part. If you have access, no access to a gym, um, doing some home based exercises like crunches, push ups, and, and squats uh, at home, um, you know, basically just getting up and down from a chair several times can work for many people. There's it's a web, good website here that shows videos on different types of exercises. So weight loss treatments, we have a bunch of, not a bunch, one, two, three, four, five, six treatments, no, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five. One was discontinued this year because of cardiovascular issues. These are all basically uh, uh, appetite suppressants. Um, and doctors, uh, some doctors are better at others at knowing the different profiles of each. I don't have much time to discuss them today. We just wanted to um, bring that up in case that you really have issues trying to uh, limit your caloric intake and there are different ones and all of them have side effects of some kind. Um, the way insurance companies pay for it is only if you have a BMI over 30 uh, or over 27 um, and one weight associated comorbidity, either type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, or high cholesterol. If your doctor actually pres um, writes this in your chart, you may have a better chance of having it paid for. Um, yeah, this is I said before. <clears throat> so the side effects is um, that some of them may increase blood pressure and heart rate, dry mouth, constipation, insomnia, uh, for men or dysfunction, and or are basically self-limited and those those related. All, everybody uh, getting on these meds have to do these requirements before you get a prescription. Is um, you have to have obviously high BMI to get a prescription. You have to have a cardiovascular exam, uh, AKG, um, just to make sure your heart is okay, and um, your blood pressure has to be treated. Uh, if you have renal disease or coronary artery disease, some doctors may or may not want to prescribe it. So there are contraindications to these medications. Now I'm going to go through the table of different ones, the uh, weight loss, what it was approved for, how it works, warnings, because you can see it on your handout. And um, basically, I don't want to spend much more time than I'm already taking up. So when it comes to hormones, it's very important because some of us don't know the basics on hormone balance. And as we get older, obviously, we tend to lose uh, certain types of hormones. <clears throat> and these are 20, 30 Two decades in people's lives, uh, everything basically goes down except insulin. As I said, insulin resistance and cortisol, which is the inflammatory, anti-inflammatory um, hormone produced by the adrenals, but it also is tied to higher fat mass. So you see estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, growth hormone, thyroid, everything tends to decrease with age. Basically, almost like nature is getting you ready to, dis to dissolve and die. And some clinics are now trying to at least balance hormones so that we can have a more uh, productive life into our um, older years. In women, um, these are premenopausal and menopausal. Before menopause, obviously through the menstrual cycle, you have um, increases in cycles of estrogen. The, these are the days of the cycle. Uh, testosterone bumps up around 14, everything types of bumps up around that time. And then you have another peak of estrogen progesterone um, in the around the 21st, 20 some days. So obviously it's very hard for doctors to measure hormones in a, in a premenopausal woman due to cycles and the fact that hormones change. Um, and what is a hormone deficiency? Only really good doctors can, can actually pinpoint and treat premenopausal uh, women with hormone um, replacement. Uh, but it, it is definitely more accepted and more um, easily uh, provided to men, women uh, postmenopausal. Uh, estrogen decreases with years of life in women and actually men too, and progesterone does too. In menopause, uh, there is a very high level of estrogen compared to progesterone, but they're all basically um, stabilize. Uh, in most cases, um, women that are over 60 years of age have the same amount of estrogen as men do uh, as they lose all the other um, 
hormones. So um, doctors tend to, and their doctors, they're actually, uh, depending on your symptoms of menopause, um, tend to provide treatment. And there's some controversial data that I don't have very much time, and I'll show you a book that you can buy to read more because we don't have time today. But these are the symptoms of hormone deficiency during postmenopause. Um, you know, if you have estrogen, low estrogen, you may have all these symptoms, headaches, hot flashes, joint pain, progesterone, and low testosterone, low libido, the decreased sex drive, uh, low mood, and lack of energy. So these are some of the symptoms doctors that are in the HRT, the hormone replacement therapy field, look at. And uh, we've seen, I'm not going to go into details, but the HRT uh, treatments can be associated with reduced total and visceral fat in women. It's actually a good study that was done with bone density scanning. An excellent book. I read it. I have to say it's the best book I've, I've read on the matter of uh, HRT in women. It's called Estrogen Matters. So you can get it on Amazon. It's from, done by um, MD and a PhD that have a lot of experience on all the misconceptions related to estrogen treatment in, um, in, in, in women, uh, postmenopausal women. There's obviously women like men need testosterone uh, and produce testosterone. The ovaries and the adrenal glands produce um, DHEA and testosterone in women. And testosterone is needed by women to keep lean body mass, uh, sex drive, uh, even mood and, and outlook. However, there are no FDA approved testosterone products for women, believe it or not. Um, and so when doctors do prescribe testosterone at low concentrations to women, for women, they do so by using uh, compounded um, gels, compounded creams from, from, a, from compounding pharmacies. Um, <laughs> because uh, there's no uh, pharmaceutical grade brand name yet uh, for women. This is a very much um, ignored topic on hormone replacement in women, even though uh, testosterone can do wonders for women that are tired, have low sex drive and, um, and low mood. And these are some of the symptoms of testosterone deficiency in women. Like I said before, fatigue, declining sex drive, lack of uh, sense of well-being, concentration, or orgasmic dysfunction, uh, arousal disorder, basically not feeling like having sex, depression, loss of bone mineral density, thinning of hair, increased body fat, and decreased lean body mass. <clears throat> Thyroid is even more, more of a problem. Um, we have no data on HIV, but you could have a very low and sluggish thyroid and or a very um, highly producing or hyperthyroid uh, gland that can have different obviously symptoms as you can see here so uh, however uh, unfortunately in this country and all countries uh, thyroid uh, function is measured with a simple test called tsh which can be very um, uh, misleading um, since <clears throat> people with a TSH that is considered normal, let's say two to three, could actually have a low uh, thyroid production, uh, hypothyroidism, and it, only uh, more intricate testing like free T3, free T4, and antibodies will determine that. And a lot of, a lot, I would say that because I work now in hormone replacement therapy, that's my new uh, basically mission. I do, um, I have a company called discountedlabs.com where I sell blood tests without uh, doctor visit and also uh, consult with many HRT and testosterone uh, companies out there. And we see really the misdiagnosis, underdiagnosis of thyroid dysfunction in women and men uh, being a big, big problem right now. Um, so there are definitely, um, there are different thyroid medications, a lot of them made by compounding pharmacies. Some of them are pharmaceutical grade that can treat low thyroid um, in men and women and 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 call and basically increase mood energy fat loss etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, i'm very i'm very concerned because a lot of people are living a substandard life a very low quality of life and they don't even know that they're walking around with a with a sluggish thyroid and sleep is very important. We are not sleeping as well as we used to because we are uh, hooked on our appliances, our uh, iPhones and iPads, and we're exposing our eyes to blue light, which is disruptive to REM sleep. And we're obviously, as we gain weight, we have more sleep apnea. 
and um, this uh, lack of sleep or poor sleep is connected to all these problems like early death, insomnia, depression, diabetes, memory loss, stroke, heart attack, hypertension, daytime drowsiness, fat, fat gain, etc. For those that have a lot of snoring and they, they, they feel tired when they wake up, it's good to be sent to a sleep study for a potential diagnosis of sleep apnea and there are different types of masks uh, that actually pump air into your lungs so that your oxygen levels don't decrease too much when you're sleeping. <clears throat> And as we age, things change when it comes to sleep, um, less deep sleep and more lighter sleep. We have more difficulty maintaining sleep due to arousals and awakenings. And sleep is less efficient and more fragmented. We wake up more frequently. And the internal biological clocks shift to earlier bed and, and wake up time. So um, there's a change in every way. Older persons experience a higher prevalence of medical conditions. And we also take more medications that disrupt sleep and are associated with sleep issues or fatigue during the day. And we have a, so as we get older, we also have more sleep disorders. So sleep apnea is another thing that most of us are, are underdiagnosed or not diagnosed. And it only really, uh, the squeaky wheel gets a grease on this type of problems. If you don't complain, um, you will never be sent to a sleep study. Um, as we as we sleep, hormones actually increase. Um, cortisol, melatonin, growth hormone, thyroid hormone, testosterone increases. If we don't sleep well, these hormones are going to be basically deficient in our bodies. Um, the most important thing that happens during sleep is cerebral blood flow spikes. Um, we actually have blood flow going into this, onto our brains and actually clean up a lot of the junk that is built up during the during the day and pulled out to be excreted by the liver and kidney. So that's the main issue and that can keep us from having dementia and even, um, you know, Alzheimer's in some cases, depending on genetic predisposition. This is something I'm also hooked on. Um, some, you know, as I said, I'm, for some reason during COVID, I've had uh, two apps that um, have made a big difference in, in my health and it's becoming really popular for, and this uh, I think it's $46 on Amazon. It's called the uh, Wellview Finger Trip Blood Oxygen Saturation Monitor. You sleep, you put it in your finger and it's hooked up to an app on the phone that actually graphs your oxygen levels through your sleep cycle and see how many times your oxygen dipped because hey, maybe you have sleep apnea, you're snoring. And when we have severe drops in oxygen, we're starving our brains from oxygen. And actually that's what increases heart risk, heart attack risk and dementia, et cetera, et cetera, increases obviously fatigue during the day. <clears throat> so this is a good quick way to find out if you may actually have sleep apnea and be sent to a sleep lab. Um, so I love, I love this guy, just probably one of my favorites. And basically the best way to have good sleep hygiene is to try to relax before bed, spend more time in the daylight, uh, actually getting some sun in your face or your eyes. Uh, don't read an iPhone or I, I, iPad or even uh, watch TV on the on TV on, in bed. Read a paper book if you have to. Uh, have a very light dinner, not too late because that actually has been shown to decrease sleep quality. As I said, avoid all the um, electronics in bed. They have blue light that affects your 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 actually your your sleep cycle. Keep your room dark and cool. If you're having problems falling asleep, uh, melatonin is a supplement. I do. Uh, I take chewable melatonin that I get on Amazon um, because it works faster and it's actually pretty pretty efficient, pretty effective. Um, try to go to bed and get up at the same time every day. That really is part of the sleep hygiene and we we tend to actually sleep better don't watch tv in bed and stay hydrated even though people are afraid to drink water at night because they get up and pee uh, more often and the last but not least is uh, mental health is actually a survey done in 831 people with hiv um, they're aged 50 years or older and was recently published <laughs> this year and it was very disconcerting to be honest with you because 56 percent have been diagnosed with depression 31 have been diagnosed with other mental health issues 27 percent have been diagnosed with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder ptsd um, 46 percent felt down or depressed 39 percent felt lonely or isolated within two weeks prior to taking the survey 
25% when 24 hours without interacting with another person. So we have to be very careful because it really, really is something that is affecting a lot of us as we get older. Uh, we have to somehow find more friends and it's not a very easy thing to do through the COVID time, obviously, because we're all isolating. Um, try to, uh, even if you cannot see somebody, call your friends, talk more. Um, try to avoid the bad news, the news, have better sleep uh, so your mood doesn't get affected too much. Uh, uh, positive, um, it's easy to tell somebody to be positive, but it's really a daily, daily struggle for all of us to keep um, mindful of what we have, how long we've come along. We've been fighting this illness for so long and we lose perspective on how far we've come to even stay alive and, and healthy like we are. And, and we lose, I do, I, I do have a strong history of depression and family history and myself. So I have to, it's a constant, it's like working out, like going to the gym, you have to make sure you stay mindful. I, I follow, you know, I've read a bunch of books and I follow the work of Edgar Tolle, um, The Power now because uh, he really has taught me to be more mindful of um, this self-talk that I have to myself and how uh, we have to avoid putting ourselves down we can be the worst enemies some of the depression can be clinically can be related to our health like low thyroid can cause depression low testosterone uh, low hormones um, maybe we're broke maybe we 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 just lost a relative to COVID so there are many situational related um, depressions and there are all, all the times where we look around, we have it all, and we're still depressed and feeling like we have no motivation. So we all have to find a reason to live, a, a message to, to live by, to get up every morning with something to do that is actually productive and beneficial, not to us only, but to the world. I really think so. Um, this I saw this somewhere, somebody texted to me like years ago, and I saved it. You can tell it's kind of blurry, but these are the seven cardinal rules in life. I don't even know where this is from. I apologize. Um, we have to make peace with our past so it doesn't screw up our present. Well, we've heard that before. What others think of you is none of your business. And we, some of us, just live and afraid or worried about what people think of us or what they think of us. Time heals almost everything and give it time. And sometimes I, I don't have the patience to grieve or, or give things time. And I want things quickly and I want to fix them now. Don't compare your life with, with the life of others and don't judge them. You have no idea what their journey is all about. Stop thinking too much. It's a right not to know all the answers. They will come to you when you least expect them, especially when you're more calm and less stressed. No one is char in charge of your happiness except you. And we all know that, I mean, we've been told, but um, years are going by. I'm 61, being positive for a long time. My HIV viral load was not detectable, undetectable until seven years ago. We've been afraid of dying. We've been afraid. We think we have trauma. We we are survivors. And we've done a lot of work to, to be here. So we have to keep that perspective. And you know, smile. Even if you don't feel like you don't own all the problems in the world. And sometimes it's just contagious to smile somebody who may actually be doing worse than you are that day. All right, well, these are resources. I do have a Facebook group uh, called Post Health, where basically women and men with HIV, we discuss things. And you, all you have to do is um, send um, an email. Do I have it here? What did I do? Oh, I can't, I can't believe I didn't have. You basically send, and well, Google groups uh, .io slash g uh, slash post health and you can join there but you can also send an email but i forgot to put it here um and i won't waste your time on that but yeah definitely google post health uh group and uh, join us there and this is a group for women in in facebook it's not hiv related it's mostly for hormone replacement therapy uh, called uh, women's hrt you can also uh, find it on facebook well, thank you very much, and I'm glad that I've been able to share this. I'm sorry that I've gone a little too long, and uh, hopefully we all have some questions. Thanks a lot.